Okay. The 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 agreed debate uh, title was what does the, what is what does the Quran say about the previous scriptures, the Torah right. and Injil Gospel. Exactly, that's it. We we both what agree. Are you happy with that, Ahmed? Yeah, that is. Yes. What is the Quran's view on the Torah and Injil? All right. You, you, you need to speak up a bit, James. You're a little faint. I said, the title is, What is the Quran's view of the Torah and Injil? Okay. And we both agree to be recorded, yes? I agree yeah, to be did. recorded. Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, since... Um, Robert Skinner is the one that is uh, asking the question. I will let you open. I will let you start. Okay. All right, Robert, you can go right ahead. Oh, you want me to start? Yes, since, yeah. since, okay. since you're the one asking the question. Okay. Well, uh, um, picking up the Quran for the first time in English, not Arabic, I don't speak Arabic, um, it, it seems to me that the Quran consistently assumes that the what it calls the Torah, the Torah, and the Injil, the Gospel, were extant at the time of Muhammad, and they had not been corrupted. There, there is no hint in the Quran. There's no warning in the Quran. Oh, that Bible has been corrupted, or don't go to the Bible because it's been twisted, or bits have been taken out. Um, uh, Surah ten. Ayah 94, that's verse, Surah 1094. So if you, and I'm reading from the Halali and Khan translation. So if you, O Muhammad, are in doubt concerning that which we have revealed to you, i.e. that your name is written in the Torah, Torah and Injil Gospel, then ask those who are reading the book, that's a singular, Al-Kitab, the Torah, Torah and Injil Gospel before you. Verily the truth, so it calls the Torah and Injil truth, that verily the truth has come to you from your Lord, now a warning, so be not of those who doubt it. It seems in this verse and other verses that the Quran assumes that the Bible is extant at the time of Muhammad in the 7th century, or I don't wish to argue about whether it's 7th or 8th century, but it, it, it assumes that it was extant, it was existing, and it's uncorrupted. Um, another, another passage... And then I'll probably finish here and pass the mic would be Surah 6, 114 to 115. Um, Say, O Muhammad, shall I seek a judge other than Allah while it is he who has sent down to you the book, the Quran, explained in detail. Those to whom we gave the scripture, the Torah, Torah and Injil Gospel, know that it is revealed from your Lord in truth. So again, it's called truth, but... Um, the Torah and Injil are also called scripture. So be not of you of those who doubt. And then the next verse, Surah 6, 115, And the word of your Lord has been fulfilled in truth and in justice. None can change his words. And he is the all-hearer, the all-knower. So it seems to imply that the Torah and Injil are truth. It calls them truth again. It calls them scripture. And then in the next verse, Surah 6, 115, it says, none can change his words. So that's really my opening statement. I, I pass the mic to um, Ahmed. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the first thing I want to say is that, yes, that is true. Even if you look at uh, chapter 5, verse 47, it says, so let the people of gospel judge by what Allah has revealed. So why would Allah tell you to, like, judge by the gospel if, like, gospel at that time was corrupted? That's number one. Number two is that, I mean, uh, that's number one, that gospel at that time, like, it, like, think of it in this way. God is sending prophets to guide humanity. And what will, like, people before Prophet Muhammad do, 100 years before him, 200 years before him, they will have no guidance at all. That's unfair. But of course, they will have some guidance from the last prophet, that is, Prophet Jesus, so they would have the Bible. Uh, but, of course, after Prophet Muhammad came, we, don't, we didn't need the gospel anymore, and I'm going to come to that. So, um... Uh, uh, the Quran does say that the revelation of God, the word of God or the uh, Wahi, it cannot be changed. But the argument that we make is that modern day Bible isn't the revelation of God at all. It does have 
some truth in it, like in terms of translation. For example, we don't say the translation of Quran to be the Quran. It is the original only in Arabic. For example, we have a way of Rukia healing, uh, exorcism, uh, yeah. So like, um, I would say for devils and whatnot, or even for general healing, we cannot read the English Quran and we don't believe that that will work either in our prayers. We don't read the English Quran or even 21st century Arabic Quran or uh, Egyptian Quran or any other uh, Arabic except for the classical 7th century Arabic, except for that language. We don't um, read or recite anything else because that's the 7th century Arabic. That Quran is what we only consider the Quran to be. It's the verbal words of what we believe to be the Father, verbal words of the Father. But the modern um, Bible that we have is, well, it's translated. It's not even in the original language, but it's a copy of a copy. Like if you could bring up papers that would carbon date through the time of Jesus, maybe it was written down at that time. Maybe it's the same exact language and it maybe it's not, um, not uh, I would say, accounts of different people, then we would consider that to be actual gospel. Even the scholars say that you're not allowed to like, I would say disrespect the Bible and Torah because it does have some word of Allah in it, even now. And if you, you were to, let's say, um, you can throw it in trash. If you want to throw it away, then you have to bury it in a clean place, in a clean ground. So, yes, the, the Marma argument is, yes, that is true. At that time, Allah did say in a lot of places for the people of the book to follow the people of the book, they weren't following it. They were having different punishments for the rich people, different punishments for the poor people. But that book, 7th century book, uh, we don't even have, I would say, a lot of that uh, in 21st century. Now, the mic is yours. Robert? Yes, um, thank you. Um, I don't know where to start. He said the gospel at that time. I've written it down, quote, the gospel at that time. Could I ask him, please, what does he mean, the gospel at that time? Because there's no point in me me speaking for two, three minutes if I don't know what he exact, exactly means. What does he mean, the gospel at that time? Does he mean there's different gospels at different times? I thought he said the, yes. the, the, the time of Muhammad, I thought he said it hadn't been corrupted. So... During the time of Prophet Muhammad, there was more truth to the gospel, the Bible that you believe in. Like, we don't believe the Bible to be the NGO. We, the Bible is more like accounts of people. It's not the verbal words of the Father. What we believe as revelation to be the verbal words of the Father. There are also hadith which was saying that uh, someone was laughing on one of the words of gospel. So the Christian was saying, are you laughing on the words of Allah, the exalted? So... That, that the gospel that is being referred to the Quran is the verbal words of the Father. It's like actually the Father talking with us, not accounts of different people, not what Paul said or someone else said, not like that. Can Ahmed, can you prove what you're saying? Can you prove that the Bible we have today is not the Bible that was used at the time of Muhammad in the seventh century? Proof that I would have is give me one second. Okay. So let me look at Surah Maida five thirteen. Yes, of course. You understand, I'm not interested in Jews or Christians who did bad things. The Bible and the Quran both records Christians and Jews doing bad things, ripping people off for money. That's not my, that's not what I'm interested in. The focus of this debate is the original text of the Bible. And what the Quran has to say about that. We, yes, we, uh, we, we, we have the Bible, you see, from um, before the time of Muhammad, um, just before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, scrolls 
I think it was the whole Bible except for the book of Esther. They were put into caves near the Dead Sea in Qumran, just before AD 70. Now, these were discovered in 1945, and they read fundamentally the same as today's Bible. So if you're going to say that the Bible we have today is not the Bible that existed in the time of Muhammad, well, you need to prove that, you see. You need to give some sort of evidence, because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have um, nearly 6,000 papyrus fragments of the New Testament, um, we have um, four complete Bibles, the Old Testament portion, I believe, I'm not a scholar, I believe they're not written in Hebrew, they're written, it's the Greek Septuagint, uh, but we have Codex Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrus, Codex Sinaiticus, and another one, which name I can never pronounce, and I always forget, so we have four from about the fourth century, now that's 300 years before Muhammad, um, We've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest biblical document, and it's a very small piece of silver with the priestly blessing of number 6, 24 to 26 on it. It's called the uh, Ketef Hinnon Scrolls, and this dates from about 650 BC, and it reads the same as in my Bible. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Um, so we have textual evidence in the form of archaeological scrolls that the Bible is that what we have today is fundamentally the same. Yes, over periods of time, uh, copyists will make errors. And if you pick up a modern Bible and a modern Christian bookshop down the middle margin, they will tell you what the variant readings are. They're quite open about it. Um, the woman caught in adultery uh, in, in John's gospel. Um, some early documents put that in Luke. Others put that in John. But they're open about it. Um, there's not much textual evidence for 1 John 5, 7. Um, what's known as the Johannin comma, 1 John 5, 7. Um, it's in the Church Fathers, but there's no um, strong evidence for it in the Greek manuscripts. I don't think that's part of the Word of God. And Christians have been open about this for centuries. We, we've got nothing to hide. But if you're going to make a statement, if you're going to say, quote, the Gospel at that time, you need to explain what do you mean by the gospel at that time. Do you mean that it's a different gospel to what we have now? You need to prove this, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, all right, thank you. So, uh, what I first wanted to say is, um, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that is chapter number 2, verse number 75, Allah says to the Jews, uh, Do you, faithful believers, oh, this is the verse, Do you, faithful believers, covet that they will believe in your religion in spite of the fact that a party of them used to hear the word of Allah, then they used to change it knowingly after they understood it. And even on chapter 5, just give me one second if I can't make noise. In chapter 5, verse 13, it says, but for breaking their covenant, we condemned them and hardened their hearts. They distorted the words of the scripture and neglected a portion of what they had been commanded to uphold. You, O prophet, will always find deceit on their part, except for a few, but pardon them and mirror them. Indeed, Allah loves the good doers. So in the Quran, the scripture always means the scripture that was revealed to, um, there were four scriptures, the Bur, Indio Torah, and the Quran. So they use they distorted the words of the scripture. That is one place where the Quran says... It doesn't, that it doesn't say that, sir. It does not say that in Surah 5, 13 or in Surah 2. You've just invented that. Oh. You, you, you oh, see, I'm... I'm only interested in what does the text of the Bible say, the original text of the Bible. There are Jews and there are Christians who say and do bad things. For instance, I once met somebody who was Ahmadiyya, right? And they said all sorts of things. They said Muhammad wasn't the final prophet and this guy from the Middle East, he was the final prophet and they have their own books. Um, we have something similar. We have a heretical group called the Mormons who are from Utah. Um, OK. Yeah. These people teach, according to Islam, Ahmadiyya teach heresy. According to Christians, Mormons teach heresy. But they are completely irrelevant to this argument because this argument is on the text 
of the Bible. The, 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 the question we're debating is, what does the Quran have to say about the Torah and the Gospel? So if somebody comes along, let's say I were to say something heretical. Let's say I were to say um, the Quran has 237 surahs. Now, we, we all know that that's false. The Quran has 114 surahs, although certain older Qurans have 116 and some have 112. But if I said the Quran had 137 surahs, I'm lying. That doesn't mean that the original text of the Quran has now been corrupted and we can we can burn the Quran and throw it all away because it's been disproven. If I said something false about the Quran, that doesn't make the Quran invalid. Now, there are people in the Bible and in the Quran who say and do bad things. That doesn't mean that the original text of the Bible has been corrupted. So, you know, Surah 513, Surah 2 are, are really irrelevant to this. So. Okay, I was reading, uh, reading the translation of the clear Quran by Dr. Mustafa Khattab. That's what it's sure, sure. These were the words of. So that's number one. Number two is different Bibles, like what Catholics use, what Protestants use. Some of them even have chapters missing from one another. Like some of them don't believe this entire part was in Christianity during the time of Jesus at all. Like you can never confirm that the manuscripts that you have does actually come from like Jesus and their followers and their disciples. Yes, the manuscripts are available, carbon dated at that time, but how do you know that they were written by someone trustworthy? For example, do you know the second name of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? Second name or the biography where they used to live, where they traveled? Um, people people didn't have second names in Bible times. Um, if you were called Luke, you would be usually called Luke bar so-and-so. Bar would be the Hebrew for son of. So you would be Luke bar son of somebody else who would have his name. Um, they didn't have Christian names and surnames like we have today in the West in England. And I think we're drifting from the topic. What is the Quran's view of the Torah and the Injil. I don't care what Zach and Ike has to say about this. I don't care what Ahmed Didad has to say about this. I don't care what the Dawa guys have to say about this. I don't care about Islamic tradition that developed in the 10th and the 11th century, which said the Bible has been corrupted. I want to know what does the original text of the Quran say? And I think, sir, it's, it assumes that the Bible is the word of God, it's scripture, it's truth, and it has not been corrupted. I think that's the view of the Quran, sir. The view of the Quran is talking about the Injil, and the revelation is the word of the Father, not accounts of people. Like, it needs to be the verbal word of the Father in the original language, not even a translation. Like, as I said, we don't take the translation of Quran to be the Quran. So why would we take the translation of Torah or the Injil to be the, Sorry, to be the original one? I can't, and, I can't follow you. What do you mean, the translation of the Torah or the Injil? I don't understand you. What do you mean? Do we have the Gospel, the Injil, Bible, in the original language, like, exactly how Jesus said from his mouth or not. Yes, yes. We 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 have we have documents, some of the oldest documents um of the New Testament wouldn't be complete, they would be partial. Um the Chester Beatty papyri, now I forget if that's P sixty six or P seventy, I'm sorry I'm dyslexic, I can't remember the numbers. But that is from probably the early second century. Uh, I know that P70 and P75 are very early texts, and we have four complete Bibles from the 4th century, Codex uh, Vaticanus in the Vatican, Codex Alexandrius, um, Codex Sinaiticus, and there's another one which, which, again, I forget the name of the fourth one. But we have thousands of documents. We have thousands of papyri. Some of them are very, very small portions, mind you. Um, we also have the Dead Sea Scrolls for the Hebrew portion. Um, if you go to Jerusalem, I've never been there, but there's, um, there's a museum of the scroll. And there's this huge circular museum. And there's this circular, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's a huge circular cylinder. And around the cylinder is the Isaiah scroll that they found in Qumran. Right? Now, it reads the same as today 
there would be a few words that are missing and it might disagree slightly from the um, translation into Greek, which was called the Septuagint, because we've got two versions of the Old Testament. The, the Hebrew, in fact, we have three, I think. <laughs> I'm not a scholar. We've got the Masoteric text. Then we've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, which predate the Masoteric text, but they would be Hebrew. And then we've got the translation into Greek called the Septuagint. And it, just, it reads the same. You know, the Isaiah scroll is about 200 BC. It's over 2,200 years old. And it reads the same as in the Bibles today. Why shouldn't we trust it? Why, why should I reject scholarship just because somebody... With respect, you're the same as me. I'm not a scholar. I, I'm not an educated person with a PhD, but you're not either. Why should I reject 2,000 years of Christian church history? Why should I reject the Dead Sea Scrolls and all this textual evidence just because a person who's not a scholar tells me, mm, I think it's all wrong. I'm not a scholar either. Shouldn't we try and follow the evidence, sir? Yes, the first thing is the Dead Sea the Dead Sea Scrolls carbon dates at least one thousand years after the time of Moses. We don't know what happened in this one thousand years, how it was preserved. Rather, when people take um, the, uh, things from the Dead Sea Scrolls, they even reject some of them and they accept some of them. It's not like we're taking the entirety of Dead Sea Scrolls. And even if you did, who wrote those Dead Sea, uh, sea Scrolls? How did it survive? For us, we have an entire chain. For example, we also have something similar to the Bible, that is, uh, how the, the reports of different people, just like Bible is accounts of different people. But for us, we know the entire chain linking up to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said it, uh, and then who heard it, and then, and then his, to his son, to his son, to his student, all the way to us, and we have multiple chains like that. And we know the biography, history, of all the people in the chains, so if there are 40 people from, let's say, my teacher to all the way to Prophet Muhammad, you know, his teacher, his teacher, his teacher, we would know where they traveled, if they actually met the person, the teacher, if they actually existed in the same time or not, where they learned from. And this kind of crucial, strict test is done on them to actually, I would say, believe in that Prophet Muhammad did say something like that or it's a weak hadith. So in the same way, the Bible, when did you say the first complete Bible that you have in the 2nd century? Um, it would actually be from the 4th century. We have four of them. Codex Alexandrius, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and there's another one which has quite a long, complicated name, which I always forget. So there's, there's four complete Bibles. The Dead Sea Scrolls, as far as I know, and I'm not an expert, I'm not a scholar, I don't, I don't read Hebrew or Greek. Um, reading a couple of hundred Greek words I don't think makes me a Greek scholar, so I'm not going to push it and <laughs> try to make myself appear more than I am. Um, it's a little distracting to have the noise in the background, sir. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong button. Yeah, I think it's a little bit. Um, you said certain things. You, you talked about carbon dating the um, Dead Sea Scrolls. The trouble is you can you can carbon date papyrus and you can carbon date vellum um, more accurately, but you can't carbon date the, the ink. All right. So, yes, you might have a, um, a scroll and you can say this scroll is two and a half thousand years old. That doesn't mean that the writing on the scroll is necessarily two and a half thousand years old. Um, there's other ways that they determine the date of, of, of the um, writing. So that's the first thing. You cannot carbon date ink. Um, you also talked about the Hadith, and I get the feeling that we are moving very, very far away from what we agreed to debate. The debate title was, what does the uh, Quran say about the previous scriptures, the Torah and the Injil? And I've asked you three times. What did you mean when you said, quote, the gospel at that time? You haven't given me an answer to that. But I will answer you if I might on the Hadith. Um, I don't want to speak too long. Would you allow me to answer that? Because I don't want to hog the mic. Sure, sure. That, th thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, the Hadith is similar to the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts is about the growth of the church. It was written by Luke. And it was written by Luke 
um, it records events. It was probably written, and again, I'm not a biblical scholar, but it was probably written between 40, 50 years after Christ's death, at the very latest. Some more fundamentalist people would date it earlier. More liberal people might date it later. But at the very latest, about 50 years, the very latest, the Hadith of Bukhari is, I believe, the most authentic and the earliest Hadith, and that is over, I think, 250 years after Muhammad died. Not only that, Bukhari and many of the other um, Hadith writers, they wrote from the area round about Baghdad to Persia, and, and Bukhari lived in Bukharistan, which is north of Persia, north of Iran, Persia being the old name for Iran. So he, he wrote about two and a half thousand miles away from Mecca, about 250 years later. Now, our moderator is an American, right? So if I were I to say... So. <laughs> so if I were to say to our American in a very plummy, arrogant, limey voice, I'm going to give you a lesson, Mr. Moderator, on your first American president, George Washington. He was actually uh, three foot tall. He was a Chinaman from China. And he had um, green eyes and he, he, he had deformed hands. And I know this because of a chain of narration that I've got from, from so-and-so to so-and-so to so-and-so to so-and-so to so-and-so. Now, I am speaking of George Washington and making up a ridiculous story about him. 250 years after George Washington lived and two and a half thousand miles away. And that's why when you go to Bukhari you will find the most ridiculous statements in Bukhari, who I believe was a blind man. He was helped around parts of the Middle East. He, B Bukhari talks about Mecca being a city in a valley with a river running through the middle of it. All right? And it had fields. They would cultivate the fields and they would plough the fields of Mecca. Now, Mecca is in a desert. It's got no ploughed fields. It, it could have now because of the American Bechtel Corporation, which has built a desalination plant at Jeddah and pumps um, millions and millions and millions and millions of gallons a day of, of water up to Mecca. So they could have ploughed fields there now. Bukhari also talks about Mecca having palm trees and date trees. So it's, it's a complete fabrication. And just as my trying to talk with authority about George Washington and saying he was a Chinaman, he's three, three foot tall, he had green eyes, and I can quote my chain of narration, who somebody told it to so-and-so, who told it to so-and-so, who told it to so-and-so, who told it to me. The fact is, I'm writing about George Washington two and a half thousand miles away from America, 250 years later. What I have to say is junk. And the Hadith... Um, I'm afraid the Hadith is not going to last very much longer in Islam because it's discrediting a lot of Islam. It's been opened up to Western scholars and it doesn't hold water. But I think we're moving away from the focus of this debate, which is what does the Quran say about the, the previous scriptures, the Torah and the Gospel? And it assumes that they are the word of God, their scripture, their truth, and it assumes they have not been corrupted, sir. Okay. That is the title of our debate, so we we do want to try to uh, uh, stick to that topic of what the Quran actually says about uh, the Torah and the Gospels. Okay, so what I was saying is, I said this many times that the Quran talks about the Injil, and Injil, the revelation of God, is the verbal words of the Father. The Bible is in the verbal words of the Father. When the Bible says, Paul said this, or Paul went and did this, and this is how um, someone died. These are not the verbal words of the Father. That's number one, what I'm saying. Number two is um, the Bukhari saying, uh, like, I just want to like uh, comment on that since you said something which is not correct. Um, Bukhari talking about fields and everything, you have to show me proof for that. And the reason why we believe in the Hadith is, like, think about it, the Quran is like we got it from the Prophet Muhammad himself when he gives us other commands of keeping the beard or, and other tells us th other things. Why wouldn't we believe in what comes out in, of his mouth? And why would a part of what comes out of his mouth, the Quran, be how he said it is? 
versus the other things which comes out of his mouth, the the general commands, the general things about Islam, why would we not believe in that? And it's not like the first Hadith book was written down 250 years after um, the Prophet Muhammad. It is more like oral tradition is actually better than written, written tradition because we know from whom we are getting the information from. And of course, it needs to be a really trustworthy person. It's not like, for example, someone reads the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the, Gospel, uh, the Gospel of Matthew that says written by Matthew, everything's written by Matthew. But how would you, well, we don't really know if it was written by Matthew or not, but how would you know how much trustworthy Matthew is or isn't? It's like Matthew telling you stuff versus Matthew writing stuff. There's there's not really a difference on the trustworthiness. Even if the book was written by Sayyid Bukhari, how do you trust him? If he is, he's trustworthy, is, is he a liar? Is he making stuff up or changing it? That's why for us, the checking of trustworthiness, biography, from whom did you learn it from, is way more important. So, um, and the last thing that I want to say is that the Bible that we have, the first original, like complete, is from the 4th century how do you know from like the uh, from the time of Jesus, Jesus until the fourth century, there weren't people who were writing down, let's say maybe a page or a few sentence of wrong things? Like how would you know? Because we have ways of knowing it. How would you know that they weren't writing it down for their worldly desires? Maybe they want to be, um, let's say, respected in the society. So they may write down something special that if someone is born at this day, which is his uh, birth day, that they're gonna, they should be respected and everything. How would you know that people didn't create fake, uh, just write down fake things in the Bible and then show it to many people and give it to many people? Um, sorry, could you just repeat that last point, sir. I'm just writing it down. I, I, you've made several points. It's a bit difficult for me to follow. What was the last one? How not know? Yeah, how would you know that from the? Uh, time of Jesus until the 4th century, because from the 4th century you, we have the complete Bible, there weren't people who wrote down wrong things or corrupted the Bible. Let's say on 50 AD or after the death of Jesus, 10 years after the death of Jesus. Um, right, you've made several points. Um, I cannot quote from the Hadith of Bukhari from memory where it talks about Mecca having fields and a river running through the, the middle of it. I believe that a lot of the Hadith comes from the Abbasids. The Abbasids made huge, huge changes, I think, to Islam. The Chinese called the Muslims the, the black and white people because the Chinese were great record keepers and the Muslims were, were traders. So when they, when they went to China, they said, we've got this new religion, Islam, this is what it is. And the Chinese made copious notes. Years later, the Muslims came back to China and they were very insistent that their religion was true. And the Chinese said, OK, explain your religion to us. And they wrote it down, what they said. And it was totally different to what they said previously under the Umayyads. So it seems that there has been radical changes made to Islam from the Umayyad dynasty to the Abbasid dynasty. And that's why when the Chinese questioned them about this, they said, well, they're the black and white people because they say with total certainty that this is true. Then they turn around, they say something else is totally true. Um, the earliest Qurans only had 37 surahs. The um, Sana Palimpsest goes up to um, chapter to Surah 37. There's no Surah 38 to 114 in the Sana Palimpsest. Those were added later. Um, You've also talked about the oral tradition trumping everything. OK, OK. Let me let, let me try this on our moderator, James. Um, there is oral tradition, sir, that the Americans lost the War of Independence and that um, the, the British monarch is still the King of America. King Charles is the King of America. And we have oral tradition for that. Now, I don't want to rope the moderator into the debate. That wouldn't be fair. But I'm sure that um, he'd have quite a lot to say to me about that. Um, you cannot use oral tradition in that way. And the arguments you've used against the um, Bible, exactly the same arguments could be used against the Quran.
The earliest Quran we have is the Sama Palimpsest, found in 1975 in the um, mosque in Sana in Yemen, Yemen where they're having a big civil civil war at the moment. And it, it goes up to Surah 37. It also it also differs um, from Jimmy. It also differs from modern Qurans, just as there are modern Qurans in Arabic which which differ among themselves. Um, let me give you one example. I mean, there's many examples I could give for the difference between the Sana and today's Hufs. I take it you're using the Hufs Quran today. Um, in Surah 2, uh, verse 88, I'll say verse rather than Ayah if you mind. Uh, so the 1924, what's known as the Hufs version, which was canonized in 1924, OK, because they had problems in the Muslim world because people were memorizing the, the Quran and different parts of the Muslim world had different recitations in Arabic because the Arabic was very different. So they canonized in 1924 the Hufs version. And that was extended. I think I think the Saudis extended that in the 1980s. So, so 1924 uh, Hufs version Surah 288 says, and they said our hearts are wrapped. But in fact, Allah has cursed them for their unbelief. So little is it that they believe. Obviously, this is a translation from the, the Hufs version. Allah has cursed them for their unbelief. But if you go to the Sana Palimpsest, in Arabic it says, and I don't read the Arabic, so this is the translation of it, and they said our hearts are wrapped. But in fact, Allah has cursed them for their injustice. So little is it that they believe. Not a big difference. One says injustice, the Sana Palimpsest, the earliest Quran we have. The modern Qurans today says unbelief. So there are differences between the two. Now, there's 93,000 differences between today's modern Qurans and the seven main texts of the Quran that we have, of which the Sana Palimpsest is the most important. Um, I've talked an awful lot. I haven't gone through your list. I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps I should pass the mic because I shouldn't speak too much. Um, okay, so first thing I want to say is that do you mean in the Sana we have so, do, you, do you mean in Sana we have the, like the complete Quran, the first complete Quran or what do you mean by that? The, the oldest Quran in the world was discovered in Sana the capital of Yemen in 1975 with other old documents. And it's called the Sana Palimpsest. A palimpsest is where you, you write on vellum, you, you write on leather. But because it's so expensive in olden times to write on leather, because you'd have to kill a whole flock of sheep to make one single book. All right. They wrote the Quran out, but then they decided to change the Quran. So they scrubbed it out. They literally used soap and a, a cloth and they scrubbed it out. And when the pages were clean, then they wrote the new Quran over it. But what happened is that over time, over the centuries, some of the ink that was left from the old, the first Quran has bled through. And that's what a palimpsest is. So you can actually read in parts of the Sana palimpsest, particularly when you put it under blue light. When it's under blue light, you can read the older Quran more clearly. You can't read all of it. You can only read a tiny amount of the older Quran, but you can see how the Quran has developed and it's changed over time. So when I said Allah has cursed them for their injustice, that's the more recent Quran in the Sana Palimpsest. The earlier Quran reads differently to that, but both versions read differently to today's Hufs 1924 edition. And the Hufs edition, are you aware that there's many Qurans in Arabic all over the world that read differently? Yes, I am aware of that. But those are the same Quran with different accents and, um, yeah, you can say accents, dialects. No, no, no. Um, Surah 285. I don't read Arabic, but I've got the Arabic in front of me. Surah 285, the Hafs version says you do. OK, that's second person plural. 
But in the Warish version, the Warish is popular in Morocco and Tunisia. I went there on holiday once to Tunisia, and I went away from the tourist group, and I, I walked around the largest, the second largest Colosseum in, in the world, which is in the middle of the Tunisian desert. So the Warish version says they do, which is third person plural. So Hafs at 2.55 says you do, and at two two sorry I'm sorry I'm just I'm just tired. Hafs at two eighty five says you do, but the Warish at the same verse two eighty five says they do. Now there are ninety three thousand changes like this between the different versions of the modern Quran and the seven oldest Qurans that we have extant. So uh, the first thing is, we have the uh, Quran, a, a few pages in the University of Birmingham. Two, where... two pages, and it's called a folio, because it's just two pages. It's not an entire Quran, it's two pages. Yes, it is two pages with 95% accuracy, that's number one. So number it's not 100% accurate, is it? It's a very old copy of the Quran and it's not 100% accurate. It reads differently to today's Quran. That's what they're saying. I I don't know if it's 100% accurate or not. That's what they're saying. 95% well, accurate. You, you said it's 95% accurate. If it's 95% accurate, it's not 100% accurate. You, you, you see, scribes make mistakes. That's that. Yeah. That's a fact. Over time, scribes make mistakes, but it's dishonest to say my religion has no mistakes. Now, the Bible, the Bible scholars are honest. You can go to any Christian bookshop and buy a, a big study Bible. I've, I've got one here. I've had it for over 30 years. Perhaps if I bought another one today, I wouldn't buy this one. It's the New King James Version. And in the middle column... Um, for instance, I'm just looking at random, um, random, and it, it will tell me, it will use the, the letters NU, omits, you will. That's at uh, chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 7. So NU, that's the Nestle's text, admits, you will. So, you know, they're honest about it. They're honest about textual variants. Now, I'm not accusing you of this, sir. I think you're sincere. But unfortunately, when Muslims say that the Quran has come down from heaven and it's perfect and it has no errors and every Quran all over the world reads the same and all the ancient Qurans read exactly the same as today. And th then when they talk about the oral tradition being perfect and everything has been... I'm sorry, but they're just not being honest with you and they're not being honest with me because that's just not true. All ancient documents have variations. Scholars make mistakes. Sometimes that they make deliberate sure. mistakes. Um, one very interesting thing about the Hadith, I did speak to a scholar the other day um, at a very notorious mosque in London called Finsbury Park Mosque. There was a man there who's doing time. He, he was the um, scholar there called Abu Hamza. Have you heard of him? No, I haven't. Right, he's known in the tabloid press as Captain Hook because he had hooks for hands. He lost his hands in the Afghan war. And I spoke to, he's now doing time in American high security prison for the rest of his life. The Americans will never let him out. Um, um, I'm afraid the British are very, very weak and soft. Um, now, this guy at Finsbury Park Moss was a top scholar. And he certainly knew a lot more about the Quran and the Arabic than I do or will ever do. He made a very strong point concerning Aisha in the Hadith of Bukhari. Are you aware that the Hadith of Bukhari talks about Muhammad marrying her at the age of six and then consummating yes, the marriage at the age of nine, at nine? Are you aware of that? Yes, I am aware of that. Yeah. Since I spoke to the scholar, I wasn't aware that the... Um, the thing that you mentioned, the Hadith chain of confirmation, what is, what, is, what is that chain called again? A chain of transmission. Train of chain of transmission. There are 11 chains of transmission in the Hadith of Bukhari where Aisha herself says that she had 
physical sexual intimacy with Muhammad when he was in his 50s and she was nine. Now, this scholar I spoke to um, tried to argue that uh, this was not true. They actually had intimacy later. I've simply looked at this again, and the Hadith of Bukhari is emphatic in that it says that Aisha had sexual relationships with Muhammad when she was nine and Muhammad was in his 50s. However, the scholar made one very valid point, and that is it could be, um, sorry, not the scholar, somebody else that I was listening to, it could be that it's simply a story that has been made up. Because in Islamic tradition at the time, it was extremely insulting for Muhammad to marry a, a woman who wasn't a virgin. And so it's possible, and I, I don't have the expertise to say either way, which is true, because I don't know, I don't speak Arabic, I'm not an expert in Islam. But it could be that the Hadith of Bukhari is wrong. It could be that Aisha was older than nine when she consummated the marriage with Muhammad. The reason her age was put back to nine was that um, the Hadith is not wanting to, to admit that Muhammad had sexual relations with a woman who wasn't a virgin. So you, you therefore have a choice. In Islam, you either have to admit that the Hadith is emphatic through these 11 narrations that Muhammad had sexual relations with a nine-year-old child. If you reject that, and you say this is just to cover up the fact that Muhammad had sex with a woman who was much older than that, but wasn't a virgin, so that's why they recorded her as nine years old, so she would be seen as a nine-year-old virgin. The alternative is that Hadith is just invented by the Abbasids to impose an agenda on Islam and to twist whatever the original message of Muhammad was. And certainly to disagree with the previous, um, um, the previous Umayyad um, view and concept of Islam. So you've, you've got a problem with the Hadith. Either you have to accept terrible things in the Hadith. Uh, and, and that's not the worst of them in the Hadith. There's much, much worse things than Muhammad having sexual relations with a nine-year-old child. Believe me. Either you have to accept that as truth, or you have to admit the Hadith is just manipulation, it's just invented. So the first thing is, like, I do believe that Dr. Muhammad did marry a six-year-old and had uh, intercourse at a nine-year-old. Because even at that time, at that people, Christians, Jews, pagans, they did no, nobody had the concept of 18 or it needs to be a certain age. It was very common. Even the kings and queens of um, in the Western world, with a few hundred years back, they would even decide that they're going to give their daughter in marriage, who was like two, three years old, to this prince. And of course, they would do that on an earlier age as well. And even in Bangladesh, 50% of the girls are married before the age of 15. So it's uh, only Western thing. To consider the 18, 51% of the girls in Bangladesh are married before the age of 18 because they don't have the concept of pedophilia. pedophilia. They don't, they never heard of it. They don't know the thing of 18. Yes, they have it in their law now, but barely people do practice it. It's not considered to be uh, immoral in anywhere except for the, I would say, last 100 years in the West, the Western world. And of course, it's coming on to the other countries now. That's number one. Number two is. Could you make one point? Could you make one point? I've, I, I've made the same mistake myself and I apologize to you. It's difficult for me to concentrate if you make multiple points and there's banging in the background, which there is at the moment. I can't really. It's easier for me if you make one single point, sir. OK. OK. So. OK, so let me make one point. I mean, that is pretty much my point, that uh, the marriage that which you consider to be immoral, like Prophet Muhammad marrying a nine-year-old to be something really bad, is actually be also being practiced by Christians and Jews of that time. It's also being practiced by other people in Bangladesh and Africa right now. It's not only, it's not only being practiced in the West this much. But that is very off-topic. Um, okay, you can um, say something, and then we're going to get back on... Mm -hmm. with the Quran would and you, what does the Bible 
yeah, would would you mind if I went off topic and just quoted Surah sixty five four to respond to what you said about child marriage? Yes. Thank you. Um, Surah sixty five four, and those of your women as have passed the age of monthly courses, for them the idda that's an Arabic word which means prescribed period. If you have doubts about their periods, is three months. And for those who have no courses, i.e. they are still immature, their idda is th three months. Likewise, in, except in the case of death. And for those who are pregnant, whether they are divorced or their husbands are dead, their idda is until they lay down their burden, which means they give birth. And whoever fears Allah and keeps his duty to him, he will make his matter easy for him. Now, this is talking about three types of women. One of them have passed menopause, so they have no monthly cycle. They have no courses, as the Quran puts it. The second group are too young to have courses. They're before the age of puberty. And the third group would be pregnant women. And the idda, which means the waiting period before you can remarry. Um, sorry, I think I got that wrong. The idda was the waiting period before you can remarry another man. Um, after they lay down their burden, which means they give birth, then they would be able to um, remarry another man. So you have three groups of women, past menopause, prepubescent, not at puberty, and pregnant women. And the Quran is giving the idda, the prescribed period, before they can marry another man. Now, in the case of prepubescent girls, that means that they can marry a man who has sex with them. They have to make sure that they are still immature and there is a, a waiting period of three months before they can marry a mo another man who can then have sex with them. And if he's not happy with a little girl, well, he can divorce her. So she's divorced twice and then she can marry a third man all before all before puberty. And this is advocated, sir, in the Quran, Surah 65, 4, which I find personally immoral. Okay, so the first thing is, um, it's not, it, it, you never see this to be practicing among the Muslims where you just randomly keep divorcing a girl even if you have the ability. Rather, divorce rates are really high in USA, even though it's getting down a little bit, but it's, it's, it, this is not how we, I would say, understand the entirety of Islam. Islam isn't only about following the Quran, it is also about following what Prophet Muhammad said. And of course, by understanding everything what they said, it's, we, we don't usually just marry and then divorce in the three months. And three months, they need to, be, by the way, be together. According to the Hadith, they need to be, be together in the same household. And of course, there is the thing of Mahar, where you need to, where, where if the girl uh, can want like $5,000 or $10,000 or any amount of money or anything that she wants. And if the guy has, will marry her, then he will have to give her that or else the marriage is not valid. So marriage isn't that easy in Islam. It is pretty easy, but not that easy to easily just ma keep marrying and divorcing. That's not uh, also what doesn't happens. Doesn't the money go to the ch little girl's parents? No, no. It is entirely owned by the girl. Is it? Okay. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In Southeast Asian culture, of course, the parents take the money and the... the ah. It's, it's, yeah, ah. South Asian culture is very different, but how ah. it's actually being practiced, that isn't the case. So the parents take the money on behalf of the little girl and look after it for her. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, some of them they do, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of the times, the, let's say the amount of mahar is like uh, really high just to show off to other relatives and whatnot, but the guy eventually doesn't pay the entirety of mahar. But that's only what happened in Saudi Arabia. I haven't heard of this happening in Saudi Arabia or any other countries. All right, I'd like us to move back to, to the topic um, that we agreed upon at the beginning because we could spend a lot of time on this and really get sidetracked. So we can get back to the question at hand of what the Quran says about the angel and the Torah. Um, well, I think I really rest my case that um, in Surah 10.94, the Torah and the Injil Gospel are called truth. 
Um, Muhammad is told by Gabriel, or rather Allah, the account is that Allah, through Gabriel, tells Muhammad, then ask those who are reading the book, that's Al-Kitab, a singular. Very interesting that it's a singular Al-Kitab, not Kitabain, which is a plural of two, or Kutub, which is a plural of three or more. It's Al-Kitab, singular, and that refers to the Torah and the Injil before you. Verily the truth, that's of the book, has come to you from your Lord. So it calls the Torah and the Injil the truth. It calls the Torah and the Injil scripture and truth at Surah 6114. And then it says none can change his words. Um, I think you've made various claims about the Bible. You did say at the start that this was the gospel at that time. And I kept asking you to explain what you meant by that. So maybe I'll just stop there and give you the chance to answer that. Thank you very much for your patience. OK, so the first thing is when Allah says Allah talks about the Injil and the gospel, uh, Injil and the Torah. Uh, uh, let's talk about the Torah first. The Dead Sea Scrolls is a thousand years carbon dated after the, the time of Prophet Moses. Like we don't know who wrote it down, how it's preserved. And of course, no one can change God's word. But they can write down different things and associate that with God. This is what we believe did happen with the Bible. They can write down different things and say that this is actually written by God. In between the verses, they can write down different things. And the Injil, the revelation, the Quran, Torah, Injil should only be what the Father had said, what Allah has said, nothing else. This is what we always believe the revelation to be. This is why the entirety of Quran is believed to be only what Allah has said. Allah has verbally said, Angel Gabriel heard it and then came down from the heavens to tell Muhammad. Or, um, And that is also how we believe revelation was received by other prophets as well. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, where Gabriel, Gabriel would hear it come down from the heavens to the earth and tell it to the prophets or they would hear it directly from themselves. But that's besides the point. The point is, right, on the, right now, the Bible that we have is accounts of different people. It's not the verbal words of Allah. And we also don't have, I would say, before the second century, before the first century, 40 years after Prophet uh, Jesus died, how will we know that that thing was preserved? And how will we know that that thing wasn't being corrupted? For example, we do believe that Paul says a lot of the things which contradicts Jesus, even in the Bible. And we, if anyone like that comes in Islam who contradict what Prophet Muhammad said, we would instantly call, call him a deviant, a fabricator. He is out. Nobody's believing him at all. And yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So. Um, well, thank you. Um, you say, I, I, I wrote down what we believe. I, I wrote it down. You were talking, you were talking rather quickly, sir. You said, this is what we believe. And then you talked about scripture coming down from heaven to earth. And you said again, this is what we believe. Um, where does the Quran say that? Of the Torah and the Injil. Christians and Jews do not believe that the Bible floated down from, 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 from heaven. Um, we believe that um, in, the, in the case of the New Testament... Um, people who uh, accompany Christ and witness his resurrection. They wrote about their experiences of Jesus. Luke and Mark were not apostles, uh, but they accompanied the apostles on their missionary journey. So what you have in the New Testament is people writing about their experiences of Jesus. We believe that they are inspired by God. We don't claim that it came down from heaven. And as for Moses, Moses was a man who encountered um, God. He met God on the mountain and he wrote of his experiences. I could say a lot more about that, um, but you need to back up what you're saying. I think the problem is the Quran says, and I go back to Surah 1094 again. So be not of those who doubt it. The Quran warns. That look, I'll, I'll read again. Then ask. The, I'll, I'll read the whole verse again. Surah ten ninety four. 
Allah says through Gabriel to Muhammad, So if you, O Muhammad, are in doubt concerning that which we have revealed to you, i.e. that your name is written in the Torah, Torah and Injil Gospel, then ask those who are reading the book, the Torah and Injil Gospel before you. Verily, the truth, it calls it truth, has come to you from your Lord. Here's the warning. So be not of those who doubt it. You're not to doubt the Torah and the Injil according to the Quran. Now, where is this Torah? Where is this Torah? Where is this Injil that you're referring to that is not, not corrupted? I mean, where is it? Where do I go to find it? Where was it? Could you please explain that to me? Because the Quran assumes that it, it was extant in the 7th century. It was existing. And the Quran calls it the truth. It assumes that it was not corrupted. And, and we have thousands of documents that predate the 7th century. Such as the Dead, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Ketef Hinnon Scrolls from 650 BC, just a little piece of silver, but with the pre but with the priestly blessing on it from 650 BC, and it reads the same as in my Bible: "The Lord bless you and keep you; the Lord make His face shine upon you." It reads the same. So you know, if you go to make a statement, sir, um, perhaps in summary, um, you would need to back up what you're saying. I say that with the greatest of respect. Then you said Paul contradicts Jesus. Perhaps that would be another discussion for another time, because once again, you've given no evidence. You've given no proof. You've just made a statement. I mean, I could say um, I don't wish to cause offence, but I could say things about Muhammad that you might find offensive. But it really would be offensive if I made those comments without giving proof or evidence, if I just made them up. And I, I feel that when you say Paul contradicts Jesus, the problem I have there is that you've given no evidence for that. I don't think we should get sidetracked onto a new topic. So uh, I don't know if we're going to be summing up now, but I'll, I'll pass the mic over to you, sir. OK, so. Um, what was the last? Uh, what, is, what is the thing that you said before? Um, Paul, if we're talking about Paul. Well, you said this is what we believe. And then you said uh, that the Quran came down from heaven to earth. And you assumed that the Bible has to come down from heaven to earth. Uh, Christians and Jews don't see scripture in that way. We don't believe that there is a copy of the um, Bible in heaven and that a copy of that came came down to earth. We believe that the Bible was written by men who were inspired by God who encountered God um, and, and, and wrote about their experiences. I see. So, but the thing um, is, I, I just interject for clarity. Um, Robert also asked you, what uh, Bible was the Quran referring to? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, and what, 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 what Bible is there that isn't corrupted that the Quran said that we could trust? What, what, what angel gospel uh, and what Torah uh, was uh, the Quran referring to when it said that is something that, uh, that is something that we can trust? So I think that's the most important question that, 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 that Robert asked. Yeah, this is the most important question. What I'll do is I will um, find out and look into evidences because I didn't like list them all up. I just, I, I just looked at them all and I, and I forgot it, you can say. And we can have, uh, and I can to tell you those later on like the gospel of the 7th century, what they were talking about and everything. And the last thing I want to say is that we don't believe the book itself, like in pages came from the heavens. We, we believe the angel Gabriel heard it from the father and then come and set it down. And I'll show you where <coughs> what we mean by Injil is only what the father has said and nothing else, not the accounts of different people, because that is similar to Hadith that we have. And I'll also show you and find new evidences of Hadith being written down because I have like heard an entire lecture about it. Hadith being written down during the time of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, this is what one, uh, Umar radiallahu has said, that there's another disciple who has wrote down, who knows more, uh, hadiths because he has wrote, wrote down more hadiths. I'm going to find all the evidences and show you. But for now, I don't have the evidence. I think the first hadith was written about 870 AD. I'm not sure about the Islamic dating, but eight, 
170 AD, and I think that's the Hadith of Bukhari. I'm obviously just a layperson. I'm not an expert. I don't have a, a PhD in Islamic studies. But I think I'm correct in saying that the Hadith was first written about 250 years after Muhammad. And that is like me having a chain of narration from, you know, George Washington's mother said to George Washington's son, who said to George Washington's great, great, great grandson, who then said to this person, who said to that person, who said to this person, who said to, to Ken President Kennedy's best friend, who then said to President Nixon's best friend, who said to him, who said to me, Robert Skinner, so and so and so and so and so and so about George Washington. And if I, living 250 years after George Washington, 2,500 2, miles away from America, I've never even been to America. How, you know, how would the Americans feel if I started dictating, well, your American history is all wrong. I don't care about your history books. I'm a plummy, pomp pompous Englishman. I'm going to tell you about George Washington, who is three foot tall. He came from China and he had green eyes and he had deformed hands. And he used to do this, that, and the other. And I know that because I've got this chain of narration. The chain of narration is invalid because I'm writing from Plymouth in the UK, two and a half thousand miles from America, 250 years later. It's, it's, it's just invalid. Um, I, could I finish with one other verse that I'm surprised you didn't bring up from the Quran? Surah, Surah 2, would you mind if I commented on that? Yep. Um, I'm surprised you didn't really go to this verse, Surah 2, 78 and 79, because it's the one passage that people go to to try and claim that the Bible has been corrupted. It's not talking about the Bible. It's talking about what's called the Umiyun. These were unlettered people who lived among the Jews. Now, the phrase among the Jews means that they're not Jews. These were Arab converts to Judaism. And what they did was, it says they didn't know the book, meaning they didn't know the Torah. So what they did was they made their own book, right? And then they tried to sell it, verse 79 says, for a little price. In other words, they were basically, it's similar to Mormonism, okay? They joined Judaism, and like the Mormons, they made their own book, which they tried to flog for money. The Jews wouldn't have it, because most Jews are very, very smart. And so it was all a complete failure. Now, some people try and claim that this is saying that the Bible has been corrupted. It's not. I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, Surah 2, 78 and 79. And there are among them, this is the Jews, unlettered people, this is the Umiyun, Arab converts to Judaism, okay, who know not the book, so they don't know the Torah, but they trust upon false desires and they but guess. When the Quran says they trust upon false desires, it means that these are converts to Judaism who are rather dishonest people. Then in verse 79, then woe to those who write the book with their own hands. Now that's a book of their own invention. It's not talking about the Torah. It's not saying that in the 7th century, the Torah was invented for the very first time. No one ever heard about the Torah before the 7th century when these people invented the Torah. No, they invented their own book, similar to the writings of the Ahmadiyya sect or the Mormons. So Surah 279, then woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, this is from Allah to purchase it with a little price. Woe to them for what their hands have written and woe to them for that they earn thereby. So it's not even referring to the Torah at all. That's the only verse I found that Muslims tend to go to to try and argue that the uh, Bible has been corrupted. And of course, if they had invented the Torah, if this is talking about the Torah, then how do you explain the fact that seven centuries before this event, the Torah was put into the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves in Qumran in about AD 70? How would you, how, actually six centuries, how would you explain that? Um, so, you know, this is, this is the only verse that people use. And I think really that is my, that's all I've got to say on that. So I'll, I'll pass the mic. Thank you for your patience. Okay. I actually didn't come across this verse. Um, I'll have to link to uh, look at what it is saying because 
the verses of the Quran were, were revealed in certain times for certain situations and events. And I think the next time if we talk, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna bring you evidences on why we consider the hadith to be trustworthy, how it is similar to the Bible, but just more trustworthy, written by more trustworthy people and everything. And there has been um, several scrolls, pages um, of hadith written down. Like even, I think we have one carbon dating at the time of Prophet Muhammad when, and we have that story from oral tradition that there was someone who came from a different tribe. I forgot the name of the tribe who asked um, rulings regarding zakat and uh, the, uh, Prophet Muhammad told the disciple to wrote it down and the disciple wrote it down. He took it to his own tribe, to his own country and we have that script uh, so being carbonated and I'll, I'll find you all the evidence and I'll tell you next time. Um, if we were to speak again, as I am not familiar with the Hadith, and um, you asked me to give you uh, evidence for Bukhari saying that Mecca is a um, city with with a river running through it and it has ploughed plowed fields. So I was unable to do that. I would need quite some time, maybe a month or two to look into this, not two or three days, but two or three months. OK, um, because I was not able to give you the reference for that. That's something that I um, read about and I, I can't keep every fact in my head, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate yeah, your you courteous um, discussion, sir. Okay, then. Thank you. Have a nice day. I think that's pretty all much right, all. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. This has been informative and enjoyable, and I want to commend both of you for um, keeping um, this debate uh, respectful and. Um, uh, both, yeah, um, I guess that's the best way I can put it. Uh, very one of the more respectful uh, debates I have uh, witnessed in quite some time. So thank you. Thank. So I'm I'm thankful for uh, both of you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert and James. Have a nice day. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. You all take care and God bless. Bye. 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 Bye.